The Gonzaga Bulldogs are taking on the number 11 ranked Tennessee Volunteers in an exhibition matchup on Friday. Who are the Vols and what do the Zags need to do to show on Friday that they are ready for the regular season? You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates through another season of Gonzaga Hoops. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Bet BetOnline has you covered this season with more props, more odds, and more lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, folks, Gonzaga basketball is so, so close to being back The exhibition season begins on Friday. They have two exhibitions this year, one against the Tennessee Volunteers on Friday, one against Warner Pacific, the school that Ben Gregg's father, Matt Gregg, is the director of athletics for. And then, of course, the actual regular season will begin on November 7th against North Florida. So we are getting so, so close to talking about real live basketball against opposing players, not just scrimmages, not just practices, real basketball. And what a way for the year to start. Number 11, Tennessee. Number two, Gonzaga. If you use Ken Palm's ratings for 2023, the Zags are three. Tennessee is four. This is a fantastic matchup between two elite programs, two elite coaches, In Mark Few and Rick Barnes, they've done this before. They've played closed-door scrimmages in the past, back when Barnes was at Texas. I'm I'm not sure if they've done one since he's been at Tennessee. I believe they have. Certainly, they've played each other a handful of times. They played in 2018. It was an epic battle between that Rui Hachimura, Brandon Clark-led team. Admiral Schofield was the superstar for Tennessee. I think he dropped 30, including the game winner. Uh, Brandon Clark had one of the most ridiculous blocks I've ever seen. This is a fun matchup. And typically, we don't get super excited about the exhibition games because they're often against schools like Eastern Oregon or Southern Oregon or Lewis Clark State has been a prominent one. Uh, Warner Pacific is the type of game that they've played in the past. And while there's still things to glean from those games, experiences uh, to watch out for, ways to see some of the younger guys potentially acclimated to playing at the Division One level, they don't often offer, offer that much uh, in terms of conclusions. And, and to be clear, I, I'm not expecting to take a ton from this Tennessee matchup either. I I think Tennessee is very good. Gonzaga is very good. I'm not overly concerned with who wins. It kind of depends how they appear to be trying to run this thing. I don't know if Gonzaga is going to be doing a lot of substitutions, if there's going to be a lot of playing guys that aren't expected to play as much in the regular season. And same with Tennessee. Uh, Talking a little bit about Tennessee. uh, Well, for starters, excuse me, I wanted to to plug this there. Uh, For those who are not sure about purchasing the game, it is $9.99. It is via pay-per-view. I will post a link to how to purchase the game, uh, the stream of the game in those show notes here. All of the money is going to support the McClendon Foundation. Uh, It's scholarships for underprivileged minority kids. Uh, It's through Tennessee. Extremely good and serviceable thing to do. Obviously, paying $10 for an exhibition game is not something that a lot of people were expecting to do this year. Uh, I highly encourage it if you have the means, if you have the ability, because the money is not just going into some rich owner's pocket. It is actually going towards a charitable organization and a cause that is meaningful in a lot of ways. Moving on, this Tennessee team is good. They're a very veteran team. They're expected to start three seniors on this team, uh, looking at Tennessee's roster, doing some read-ups on them. I, I checked out the Almanac, which I highly recommend purchasing for those of you who have not done so yet. It's a comprehensive look at every Division One team in college basketball written by a, a variety of really, really high-profile, highly successful college media analysts. Uh, definitely worth checking out. But for Tennessee, they have a roster that's not that dissimilar from Gonzaga's, and they kind of build rosters in a similar way where they do occasionally go out and get high-profile, one-and-done caliber guys. Kennedy Chandler certainly was a big example of that as their point guard last year, who's now with the Memphis Grizzlies. Uh, But they also have a lot more veteran guys, guys who come through the system who kind of develop that way. Uh, I think this team's going to be a nice combination of those two things. They 
Again, no Kennedy Chandler, but they're replacing him with sophomore point guard Zakai Ziegler, who's expected to be one of the best point guards in the league. He was on the Bob Cousy Award watch list uh, for best point guard in the country. So clearly a player to watch out for there. Josiah Jordan James, a six foot six wing. He might be their best player. He's really, really talented, can do just a little bit of everything on the basketball court. They also have a combo guard, their shooting guard, Santiago Vescovi, who shot 40% from deep last year. He's going to be a problem as well. But again, we don't know if Kentucky, or excuse me, Kentucky, if Tennessee is going to run out there with all of their starters for 30 plus minutes a night, if they're going to mix and match, if they're going to experiment with some guys who maybe are on the fringe of the rotation and see, hey, what do you look like in the starting lineup? What do you look like, uh, you know, coming off the bench? And it's also unclear if Mark Fear and the Zags are going to be willing to do some of that stuff as well. We don't get a sense what they do often in the closed door scrimmages. We might hear a final score. We might hear a couple box score notes, but we don't really see how it's operating, this will be different. We will get to see it. We will see the substitutions. We will see, you know, a little bit of what the coaches are yelling on the sidelines, that kind of stuff. So it'll be really interesting to see not only an exhibition game between two top tier programs, which is not something you get all of that often, but a fully televised one as well. Something I'm extremely excited to kind of see how it shakes out. If we are looking matchups, if that is something that is of interest, uh, I think uh, it's notable that currently the projected starting lineup for the volunteers does not have any player above six foot eight, which means it's Timmy time. It's going to be a Drew Timmy time. It's always Drew Timmy time. He's kind of the guy the go to if, again, if they're going to run their normal offense, and they're going to go out there and do what they're going to do when the regular season starts, then you're going to expect to see a whole lot of entry passes into the paint. Drew Timmy going to work. If Tennessee's single covering him, I expect him to score a boatload of points. If they are sending double teams, I'm going to be very fascinated to see how that kick out looks. This is something that Drew has improved. His assist numbers have improved. His turnover numbers have also gone up which is not as surprising when you see a player passing the ball more but clearly you would like to see him have the ability to continue to, to facilitate to get open looks for shooters to find, make the right pass out of the entry but also doing it in a way where he's not committing a lot of turnovers part of the turnover thing was because him and Chet Holmgren both kind of alternated playing that high role and often trying to make that entry pass as they found out can be pretty difficult and so we saw a fair amount of turnovers that way without Chet Holmgren on the roster I don't expect Drew to do as much playing away from the rim which could lower the turnover numbers, should give him plenty of opportunities to score. And I'm curious to see how we see guys like Malachi Smith moving without the basketball, certainly Rasir Bolton, how he moves without the basketball, although we know that's going to be quite solid because it was for him last year. And then, of course, the recent officially announced move that Julian Strother is going to play this year as the small ball four, similar to the role done by Corey Kisper during the 2021 season. This was confirmed by John Rothstein of CBS Sports that this is how they plan to deploy Julian Strother this year. We've been talking about it for months on Locked on Zag, so we've kind of been expecting that it's going to be a three-guard lineup with Julian at the four, Drew at the five, with Anton and Efton Reed coming off the bench. That appears to be the expected way for this to roll. Again, I'm not going to take how they start this game necessarily as confirmation because it is an exhibition game. It doesn't count in the standings. Things could change, but I do expect to see that lineup at least probably to start the game and probably for good chunks of the game. I don't, Mark Few doesn't like to do things too wonky. He doesn't like, he plays things fairly close to the chest. And with this game being televised, I think we're going to see more or less uh, what we're going to see from a starting lineup perspective uh, going into the season. And then the kind of last thing I'm curious about with this scrimmage game, uh, again, less results focused, less individual player performance focused. Certainly we will watch for that and we will talk about that next week if guys have notably good or notably bad performances in this game. But uh, a big part of it is just how deep are they going to go? I expect that in the regular season, this lineup is going to get continually shrank down. I think nine is, it's hard to envision it not being nine if Dominic Harris is fully healthy. Right now, I'm not expecting to see Dom in this game. The last update we heard was that he was returning to full contact practice on October 10th, which was the Monday after craziness in the kennel. If we make the assumption that he did return to full contact practice on October 10th and has continued to practice in a full capacity since then, which there's no indication that that is not the case, I'm still not sure how many minutes he would get in an exhibition game. It takes a long time to get your basketball legs under you, to get fully, to have that kind of 
amount of energy you need to, to really play full basketball. Now, does that mean he can't give you five minutes in this game, eight minutes, 10 minutes? Not necessarily. He might be able to, but I'm not sure the staff is going to be willing, ready, available to do that. I'm just not sure. I don't have a, co- a concrete answer there on what that might look like, but it is something I'm going to be watching for. Do we see Dominic Harris in this game? And then do we see Ben Gregg? Do we see Caden Perry? Do we see Braden Huff? Do we see all three? Do we see just two? Do we only see one? Do we not see any of them? Do they run a lineup with with Drew and Julian starting at the five and the four with Efton Reed and Anton Watson as your backups? And that's it. Those are your four guys. Because if we don't see these guys in the exhibition game, the odds of us seeing them much more this year are pretty slim. We're going to see Ben. We're probably going to see Caden in the Warner Pacific game because it's a, a lower quality opponent. It's an NAIA school. It's another exhibition matchup. Uh, and of course, there's the connection with Ben Gregg and his father, who, who's the athletic director there. So we're going to see him then. But if we don't see him in this game, I think it's something to at least be aware of, be cognizant of as we get into the regular season that, hey, like these guys may play in some of the the easier games, the opponents like Chicago State, which is much later in the season, of course, but also Eastern Oregon or North Florida, even Northern Illinois, whatever it may be. We might see some of those guys in those games, but we're probably not going to see them in some of the bigger games. So it'll be interesting to see if they do get an opportunity against Tennessee, because it's obviously a high quality opponent, one of the best teams they're playing all season long, but it also does not count in the scoreboard. So it'd be nice to see Caden Perry get five minutes out there and see what he can do. Can he, you know, out jump some of these guys? Can he grab some rebounds over them? Can he score over some of their, their post players, Ben Gregg, can he hit some outside shots? Braden Huff, can he just get out there and get some experience playing against really, really good players uh, at Tennessee? There's a lot of, of things to watch for this game. A lot of excitement. I'm, I'm just pumped. College basketball is back. You guys, I'm so excited to get to watch the Zags, even if we're paying for it, even if it's an exhibition game, it's still going to be really exciting uh, and it's going to be a really, really fun game of basketball. And the last thing that I kind of want to talk about here, we're going to move into the second segment. We're going to talk more about Tennessee. We're going to talk about their incoming recruits and we're going to have friend of the show and guest Jason Jordan of Sports Illustrated. He's joining us in segment number two. He's going to tell us about Tennessee's incoming recruiting class, which players on the team we should be looking out for. Before we get there, though, I want to tell you all about sweat block. It's fall wedding season, and I cannot tell you how nice it is to not have to worry about sweating through my dress shirts while out on the dance floor thanks to Sweat Block. I was able to fix my sweating issue and still cut a rug with Sweat Block. Sweat Block was created by a doctor to help with his own excessive sweating. It is doctor created and doctor recommended. If you or someone you love is experiencing embarrassing sweat or odor, try Sweat Block. Save 20% with promo code Locked On at sweatblock.com. Also available on Amazon. All right, segment two, still Andy Patton, still Locked On Zags. Still want to thank all of you for making Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. For your second listen today, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast. From the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports Today, available on this app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. All right, I am thrilled to be joined for the final two segments of today's show by Jason Jordan of Sports Illustrated. Jason, college basketball is so, so close to being back. We have an outstanding exhibition matchup on Friday between the Gonzaga Bulldogs and the Tennessee Volunteers. Mark Few, Rick Barnes getting together to put together a borderline top 10 matchup, even in the exhibition season. I'm really excited to see this. I touched a little bit on kind of what Tennessee's roster looks like in the first segment and and what, what kind of team they're going to be this year. But I'm really kind of curious to hear from you, Jason, about what this recruiting class looks like. Most media outlets had them top 20, top 25 class uh, in 2022. Uh, we know Julian Phillips is kind of the big prize. I'd love to hear kind of a little bit about his game and maybe what that whole class looks like for Coach Barnes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Julian Phillips would definitely be the, the marquee player in that class. No surprise there. Mm-hmm. He was the best player at Link Academy last year. And that's saying a lot because Link Academy was loaded. Mm-hmm. Um, but six, eight um, wing matchup problem because he because of his length. I think he I think his wingspan is like six eleven, if I'm not mm-hmm. mistaken. Well, so, you know, I mean, that right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> going to disrupt <laughs> some things on the defensive end. And he really mm-hmm. gets after it on the defensive end. Um, so he's able to disrupt passing lanes and guard pretty much all five positions. But he's mm-hmm. super skilled as well, plays with high energy, um, scores at all three levels. And um, he's a guy who's definitely going to be a matchup problem just because of all those tools. And then he's a high IQ guy. And I think 
you know, a lot of people underrate his ability as a playmaker. Mm -hmm. So he has really good vision, makes the right play, makes the extra pass. And then over the last year, his jump shot has improved, especially from the perimeter a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, So he's going to be a nightmare of a matchup for sure. You know, DJ Jefferson's, I mean, you'll see a theme here, 6'6", wing, 6'10", weak span, DJ Jefferson, lockdown defender um, there. And so BJ Edwards, um, I always thought he was very underrated. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's because he played an Under Armour circuit or whatever, but Mm -hmm. one of the best scorers to me in that class, you know, he's a bucket, walking bucket, right? And because he's a walking bucket, he gets underrated as a playmaker as well because he's Mm -hmm. got great vision, sees the floor really well, and he plays at two different paces. So a lot of those guards can only play one way. Like they're, you know, straight line up and down. They love transition, but when the game slows down, they start to get a little lost, but Mm -hmm. he's able to play in the half court set too. So he's a guy I'm really high on Um, just um, a score extraordinaire, but a a really strong playmaker as well. Gifted Mm -hmm. passer um, too. And I think people underrate him because of his scoring ability. And then Toby Awaka, Mm -hmm. six, eight work Mm -hmm. horse. I mean, workhorse just, Checks out anything that comes under the <laughs> words workhorse. That is Toby, you know, yeah. just a relentless motor. Um, at six eight, he's a great rim protector. He won Gatorade Player of the Year. Most people probably know that mm-hmm. in New York. Um, just big and physical, um, and a guy who finishes plays, you know, maneuvers in the lane really well. Doesn't try to be something he's not, and so that's one of the biggest things I love about any player. Just be yeah. who you are. Don't, don't go out there being a point guard. That's mm-hmm. And that's not him. Like, he's he's confined down there, and he's going to do his damage down there. He's going to earn his money down there in the paint. Seems to be clearly aw- acutely aware of that because he's mm-hmm. um, he's always down there, you know, causing disruption on both ends of the floor at all times. And that's saying a lot. So high motor guy, high energy guy. But you look at this, the class is – uh, relentless motors you can check that off the box for all four um guys who uh do a lot except for toby the other three mm-hmm. guys do a lot of things well play a lot of different interchangeable positions and mm-hmm. they're all playmakers um so that that is going to be tough content to contend with for sure that's a mm-hmm. strong one of the things that that i kind of noticed when i was looking at tennessee's roster initially that that definitely makes some more sense hearing your explanations was they didn't seem to have a ton of size just in the height compartment or department but obviously if they got some guys with some long arms some length uh ability to be disruptive even if not everybody is is yeah i think their starting lineup projected starting line didn't have anybody over six eight but again if they got some length some some ability to kind of be disruptive in that regard uh, i think clearly that's going to help them out a lot and you know one thing that i've kind of been fascinated about with rick barnes is his program at tennessee in the last however long he's been there but it's been a while now i think seven seven or so years uh is that they kind of have the ability to get players in who they're maybe aren't going to be on a long development track or maybe one and done guys like Kennedy Chandler or guys who, who are going to be stars right away. And then they can also kind of get guys in on the back end who develop over a couple of years. And and they seem to have a, a pretty good track record of, of having success there. And I know, you know, for, for my listeners, at least we know that sounds familiar because Gonzaga has done a very similar thing where they get guys who maybe this is going to be a three-year guy or a four-year guy, or maybe this is going to be a, a true one and done. And, you know, looking at this class, it does look like there's some pieces here that that pro- maybe aren't going to play a ton right away, but might be, you know, three years down the line, you're going to be like, well, wow, that guy was outside the top 100 right. in the class. Like yeah. that guy wasn't a high rated yeah. recruit. And it yeah. seems like they seem to do a really good job of that uh, over at Tennessee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely agree with that. And that always happens. You get, you know, mm-hmm. and that happens <laughs> more than you say. Yeah, well, that guy was really good. And he, they were right about him. That happens mm-hmm. more. So then people don't understand that because. Again, we move on. It's been three years. We don't right. hold them accountable. <laughs> of course. So I always laugh at that, too. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of really wanted to, to touch a little bit more on on Phillips uh, and what kind of impact yeah. he might have in year one. Obviously, I know that uh, you're not looking at depth charts for all 350 right. Division One teams and necessarily knowing how they're going to fit in. But a kid who I think was 13th in the class by uh, the composite rankings, like, uh, do you expect him to have a pretty big impact for Coach Barnes's team right away? Yeah, I know that Coach Barnes expects him to have a really big impact as well, you know. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you know, because he does so many things well, mm-hmm. you know, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, when when they played in the Geico, um, you know, he there was so much on him, but he, mm-hmm. you know, 
and they and you know they played a tough sketch and they weren't in the um I forget that the NIBC they weren't in that league officially mm-hmm. but they played a one of the toughest schedules um of any team in the mm-hmm. country last year and you know he was the best player on the court a lot of times in those games most times I would say in those games so he's a guy who's going to um you know he doesn't have to score 25 points he's going to get deflections He's, he's got great hands. He's going to create plays. He's going to get a piece of the paint and kick it out. He mm-hmm. He's a really heady, high IQ guy mm-hmm. um, who, you know, I've never seen somebody on the wing who's able to stay, even at even at 6'8", mm-hmm. he's getting by whoever, whenever. So just that part of it. And then if I tell you that he's a high IQ guy, you know that he's going. that's going to translate into problems for the opposing team. Yeah. And so that's what's been happening – what I'm told in practice, mm-hmm. you know, he's lived up to all of that hype in practice so far. So, you know, I definitely expect that to carry over early in the season right away. All right, Jason, I want to switch gears on you a little bit. I want to talk about the hot topic throughout most of the summer uh, for college basketball, for college sports in general, uh, which is, of course, conference realignment. Uh, huge talking point over the summer, especially when USC and UCLA made their somewhat surprising announcement that they were planning to go to the Big Ten. Uh, it talk has kind of died down a little bit since then. There was kind of this perceived expectation that maybe a whole bunch the floodgates were going to open, a whole bunch more big schools were going to move around. That obviously has not happened yet, but I kind of wanted to talk about what that might look like from a recruiting perspective, just because uh, so much of the conversation is focused on the media rights deal and the extra money right. coming to the schools. And in and, and, and Gonzaga's case, and, and certainly in USC and UCLA's case, part of the conversation is about the additional travel expenses and kind of the 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 seeming disparity between where the conference the rest of the conference is located and where those schools are located and it kind of looks odd from that perspective but i am curious just from having been out on the road so much and seen these coaches and how they recruit and how they talk to players and kind of try to get guys in the door like how much does switching conferences or the 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 expectation that hey we're you know we're in this conference now but we're going to be in the big 10 in a few years or for byu we're gonna be in the big 12 in a year or, or whatever it may be like how much is that being used to help spark recruits and how much does that seem to kind of impact how, how recruits think about schools? Yeah. So it's definitely a recruiting tool big time uh, because even just uh, I hear coaches tell, you mm-hmm. know, I don't hear it, but I hear players mm-hmm. tell me mm-hmm. uh, that coaches say, you know, we we're going to this conference, you know, mm-hmm. so, you know, you want to be on TV, you know, you're going to be on right. TV more, you know mm-hmm. um, I mean, and I'll tell you specifically with you guys, mm-hmm. um, obviously, you mm-hmm. know, coaches use the um, that BYU, I'm sorry, mm-hmm. BYU leaving. And I'm, I've heard this in the last couple yeah. months. BYU's leaving there, you know, um, mm-hmm. they're not going to play anybody. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, good luck in March. I mean, they don't win now in March, even though you're yeah. And this, mm-hmm. this other team doesn't. Um, they're not going to, and so that, that, that's something that, you know, if you guys were able to make a move to like a big East, mm-hmm. you know, um, that would, that would help that, you yeah. know what I'm saying? And then you're, um, you know, I think you, it, that would, because they, I mean, I don't have to tell your fans that mm-hmm. hate on y'all. They, that's the one, like, that's yeah. the one they're like, okay, go over there and don't be on TV then. All right, cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, like coaches really say that all the time about oh, yeah. y'all, you know? Mm-hmm. You're gonna be, yeah. You know, I mean, we'll we'll see you in March. That's the mm-hmm. I guess that's when we'll see you. You might get one or two TV games if you play against somebody big time game, but mm-hmm. you know, nobody's putting your conference games on TV. You right. know, um, so that would alleviate that. So mm-hmm. I would think from the record, that's the biggest thing. Um, mm-hmm. It would it would si- it would give you the ability to sidestep that negative recruiting mm-hmm. message that happens a lot. You ask any recruit, they'll tell you. Coaches tell them that about you guys. Yeah, I'm sure. But it's funny because it doesn't seem to have impacted Gonzaga's recruiting too much. Certainly they have likely missed out on guys for some variety of reasons, including yeah. potentially this. Like, I'm sure that there are guys who are like, well, I could go to this school and be on TV more and I could be at this school and, and you know, play this team. And totally understandable. I, that is a, a disadvantage for Mark Few and their staff on the recruiting trail. But Clearly, they have been getting the kind of players that they want. They have been developing the kind of players that they are seemingly very good at developing. Uh, so I wonder, like, 
if it's a situation where they're just they're kind of having to weed out the kids who who are maybe focused more on something that Gonzaga can't provide and they're kind of just finding the kids who hey this is a kid who wants to put his his head down and grind and three years from now maybe he's going to pop off and maybe people won't see it until March but maybe that's enough for you know these guys to pop out in the NBA we've seen it with you know guys like Corey Kispert or uh, this year likely Julian Strother who who were not super high rated recruits who turn into right. potential lottery picks and Kispert's case and potentially Strother's case as well. Uh, I wonder, like, obviously every recruit is different. Uh, and, yeah. and clearly some guys value things differently than other guys. But but how much uh, – if Gonzaga does move to the Big East, uh, and we're talking probably 2025 would be the absolute soonest this would happen. Uh, the commissioner for, for the Big East said that that's when their media rights deal is up. You'd imagine if they're looking to to try to get with ESPN or something like that, and ESPN does show a lot of Gonzaga games, it seems like a partnership could make some sense here if they can get over the geographical humps and, and everything else that, that comes with that. But uh, you think that that opens up Gonzaga's recruiting a little bit more, just more guys who, who maybe fit Gonzaga in a lot of ways but were a bit hesitant to go – out to the West Coast, games are late, not a lot of games on TV. Now that that maybe opens that door a little bit for them. Oh, yeah, I definitely think that would, would certainly help. And, you know, even, you know, a few years ago, maybe even two, maybe even one, I would be like, ah, that doesn't matter. Kids, mm-hmm. you know, that's not as big. But now we're in the NIL era. Mm-hmm. now, And we're so early in it. Yep. Kids are still being lied to. Like, they're still doing valuations uh, mm-hmm. these Third numbers. I don't even know where this stuff comes from. <laughs> like, yeah, he's worth a hundred. He's worth a hundred. That really? That, yeah. I can tell you they're not getting that. No. <laughs> like, no. Like that's a fact, you know. But it's early enough where people can lie to you. Where yep. you can be like, we don't have enough of a, um, you know, we don't have enough of a sample size to be like, hey, you know how they said you could get ten thousand? This mm-hmm. kid got five hundred. Like it, he right. didn't get that. I just want you to, you know, mm-hmm. so. But it's early enough where kids are like, okay, got to think about my marketing. And yep. now it's okay to think about marketing. It's not taboo anymore. Okay, mm-hmm. so now it will resonate more when somebody's like, hey, don't you want to be on TV? That's marketing. Mm-hmm. Again, we don't have a big enough sample size to realize that stuff don't matter as much. You yeah. It makes sense to think that it matters. Right. It's like, hey, eyeballs equal dollars, mm-hmm. right? But the reality is these kids not getting the valuations y'all are reading about. They're not right. getting that. They're not like, I mean, I'm not going to call on a website, though, but they're not getting that stuff, man. It's just good for clicks, it's good for some clicks and for y'all yep. to talk about it, but they're not getting that money. Mm-hmm. So, but because it's early enough, I do think that that will factor in. You know, uh, I definitely can tell you that moms are doing follow up questions on that. <laughs> and I how uh, the marketing and t- being on TV helps. So, yep, you know? absolutely. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned NIL, which was uh, the next kind of talk topic that I was going to bring up and I thought covered it perfectly because it, it, there's no way it's not making an impact, but it's so yeah. early. It's hard to know how much of an impact it's making. Uh, the last thing that I kind of want to talk about, and it's a conversation that uh, every, I do mailbag Monday episodes and every Monday there's questions that, that talk about the fact that Gonzaga committed one player in 2022 and they only have one player committed in 2023. And so far they don't have anybody committed beyond that, which isn't super surprising, but it's, it's clear that the Gonzaga hasn't, you know, the years previous to that, there are two three man recruiting classes pretty consistently. We're seeing less now. People are concerned if that's something that that isn't necessarily going to hold up. I've had people say, well, it seems like it's it's more of a gamble to go via the transfer portal, which I disagree with. <laughs> I think it's more of a gamble uh, if you're not getting the top, you know, if you're not getting the Chet Holmgrens and Jalen Suggs of the world, it's more of a gamble uh, to go yeah. with, you know, top outside of the top 60, 70 high school guys, I would rather gamble on, you know, the guy, Malachi Smith, the guy they secured from Chattanooga, who averaged 20 points right. per game in the SoCon. That seems like a like a safer bet to me. Do you think for Gonzaga, who has always succeeded in the transfer portal well before we had the the ability to uh, to transfer right away without sitting out a year? I mean, Kyle Wilcher, Brandon Clark, et cetera, they've yeah. had some really high-level players there. Do you think that they're doing that in part because – they're having a bit a, a tougher issue with recruits or is it maybe just the COVID year and made it harder to evaluate high schoolers or it seems like there's a lot of factors that could be at play here. Yeah. No, I mean, I think what I've heard from, you know, uh, staffs consistently. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, yeah. I, when I say consistently, I mean, everybody, mm-hmm. <laughs> they are 100% um, putting a lot more weight into the transfer portal. Yeah. Uh, just because remember they gave them an extra 15 days this year to say, yeah. Hey, I want to get out of here. Right. So that 
if you don't think 15 days is huge, I <laughs> yeah. mean, that's huge, yeah. right? Yeah. So they they know that the number is going to grow substantially this year. They're going to be mm-hmm. more and more prospects. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, you you be doing yourself a disservice to load up on uh, high school players when you can get potentially experienced mm-hmm. college guys who have already proved that they can contribute at this level. So I, I certainly know that that's what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say, you know, certainly trust the process because this is a new world. We're all learning it on the fly. Yeah. So, um, you know, you're going to be happy with the transfers that you, <laughs> that you yeah. pull when you're winning games. Um, yeah. So I, I, de- I, I'll say I know that they there is a plan and I know they know what they're doing and they're still in the mix for some guys, you mm-hmm. know, some elite guys in the 2023 class. So yeah. um, and I think we'll be learning more in the next couple months on that stuff. Well, Jason, that's a perfect uh, segue into uh, the kind of the end of the show for us. Uh, Obviously, very excited to have you continue to come on the show uh, in in future weeks as we kind of get a sense of some of those 23 guys that Gonzaga fans have been very eager to find out. Are we going to get anybody from this class? You know, is there going to be somebody who joins Dusty? Uh, Dusty Stromer, of course. And then, you know, I know we're, we have a visitor next week, the Don Thomas from the same high school as Julian Strother. He's going to be in Spokane November 5th, 6th. So hopefully we'll get some positive news out of that visit as well. Jason, thank you so much for taking the time each week to come on the show. I know my listeners really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm thankful we get to continue to chat uh, as the year gets started. I always enjoy it, man. Thanks for having me. All right, that is going to do it for me today. Don't forget to check out my written content, scorezagscore.com. We got one more player preview episode coming out on Friday right here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Available wherever you get your podcasts, available on YouTube as well. Go hit that subscribe button. Folks, we are less than five followers away from getting to 1,000 subscribers on YouTube, so go hit that button if you haven't done so yet. It is much appreciated. Finally, I want to thank all of you who have made Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. For your next listen, please check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast, the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. Available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. All right, thank you all for listening, and go Zags.